Anyone who has been wandering around the flat earth corners of YouTube is likely aware of Sleeping Warrior and his experiments. He is desperate to show that it is the medium's density only that causes things to sink or float, and he calls this the relative density disequilibrium. I have previously attempted to build a working model based on his conclusions and test the predictions that this model makes. Unsurprisingly, it failed. He didn't like this. He created a response in which he demonstrated his complete failure to understand anything. And I wrote a little response to that, and he reacted by taking a rather unsurprising approach and doing his finest to demonstrate further his inability to understand things. But let's explore the experiment a bit and explain what is actually happening. In his experiment, he takes an egg and places it in some water, and we see the egg sink. Subsequently, he poured a lot of salt in the water, and the egg started moving up. By doing this, he concluded that he made the water denser, and by doing so, he created an upward force that made the egg move. However, the experiment is pretty null and void. He didn't perform any measurements beyond two simple measurements with a TDS meter. The issue is, is that a TDS meter doesn't measure density unless you are really clever and you know how to do maths and stuff. And we are pretty safe in saying that he doesn't. But, of course, according to Sleeping Warrior, you don't need to measure things in science. The bottom line is that the medium's density is definitely a factor in making the egg sink or float. I have no problem with that, but there is more to it. We start with a simple observation, and this is that some stuff floats and some stuff sinks. Stuff appears to be lighter underwater. I mean, when I'm scuba diving, I can easily pick up rocks, which I wouldn't be able to on land. We can have a think and realize that when I bring the rock onto land, it becomes heavier. The rock hasn't change. The only thing that changes is the density of the medium. So we conclude that the density of the medium is a factor in determining the total forces acting on the object. Next, we notice that if we have a balloon in air, it is pretty light. But when I push it underwater, I have to apply a force to it to keep it down. And this isn't the case with the rock. So clearly there is a property of the object, which is also a factor. So there are clearly a few things to investigate, but let's actually consider the theory. We start with considering potential energy. Uh, whenever there is a force, there is a function which describes potential energy, and potential energy is associated with position, and it describes the energy required to move an object to that position against a force from some reference position. And this is why it takes effort to lift something, but not to drop something. When you are lifting something, you are moving an object against gravity and moving it into a higher energy state. It doesn't matter if you take Newton's or Einstein's idea of gravity, the potential energy follows the same function. Anyway, when moving an object from one position to another against a force, the change in the potential energy is described by the negative of the product of the force you are working against and the distance moved, or more properly, the negative of the integral of force with respect to position. We now take an object and fully submerge it in water, but still holding it at some height from the bottom of the tank. Uh, we'll take the object being less dense than water, and we will then feel an upward force, and this configuration is time one. We now move the object down to a lower height and we notice that we have to put a bit of work into doing that. This is because we are actually increasing the energy of the system. We now have it in a new position at time 2. What happens is that at time 1 there was a volume which was occupied by the object and an equal volume below that which was occupied by the denser water. When we pushed down we lifted that denser water against gravity. So that water ended up in a higher potential energy state at time 2. 
The downward force on the displaced water volume results in an upward force on the object as the medium is trying to displace the object for the medium to move back to a lower energy state. So here's a diagram of the system at time 1, and here it is at time 2. On the left we see the object with some mass at height hi. Its gravitational potential energy is given by the product of mass, our constant g, and its height. The volume of water is at hf, and its gravitational potential energy is given by its mass, the constant g, and the volume's height. At time 2, the situation is reversed, and the volume of water is now at height hi, and the object is at height hf. So we can describe the gravitational potential energy of the objects at the two time points. We have the gravitational potential energy of the object and the volume of water, and there's also the potential energy of the rest of the water, but that doesn't change and is therefore not relevant. But let's consider density, which is mass over volume, or mass is the product of density and volume. So we can rewrite our expressions in those terms, considering that the volume of the displaced water is the same as the volume of the object. So we get these expressions. The total potential energy at time 1 is then given by this expression, and the total potential energy at time 2 is then given by this expression. Now we are interested in the change of the potential energy, as this will give us the force acting on the ball. So we subtract u1 from u2 and rearrange. We can then write it in differential form. And considering that potential energy is the negative of the force integrated with respect to distance, force is given by the negative of the spatial derivative of the potential energy. And we finally write this expression. Now this tells us something, mainly that the net force is given by the product of the object's volume, the difference in the densities of the medium and the object, and a constant g. If the medium's density is greater than that of the object, then the net force is positive and it points upwards. It points down when the medium's density is less than that of the object. We could have it the other way around, but that coordinate system would not make sense. When we expand the brackets, we see that there is a downward force due to the mass of the object and the acceleration due to gravity, and there's also an upward force due to the force that medium is exerted on the object due to the medium being in a higher energy state. This is the buoyant force. Assuming that the object's mass and volume do not change, this describes a straight line equation with the medium's density as the independent variable. The slope is given by the product of the object's volume and the acceleration due to gravity. The intercept is the product of the object's mass and the acceleration due to gravity. This is all well and good, but this is just maths. It has no bearing on reality, right? Now, I would like to cast your mind back to what I said earlier about Sleeping Warrior and his statement around measurements not being important in science. After a short conversation, he shifted his position slightly in this comment. This is an egg. This experiment is simple. We suspend an object in a medium and then measure the force on the object whilst changing the medium's density. To measure the force, we use a Pesola light line spring balance with a range of 10 grams, and we can multiply this by 9.81 to get the force in newtons. The range of forces that we can measure then goes between 0 and 98.1 millinewtons. We hang the objects off the spring balance such that the object is fully submerged in the medium. But first we test the scale by hanging a series of test masses and see if it produces the expected result. From this calibration we can see that it is dead on. Now this does not mean that it is perfect, but we just can't resolve the uncertainty in these measurements, and they are negligible then.
The medium is going to be a mixture of water and isopropanol alcohol. The reason I chose IPA is because it mixes very well with water to ensure that there are no nasty gradients in the medium's density. On paper, the density of water is 997 kilograms per cubic meter and a density of IPA is 786 kilograms per cubic meter. But there are slight variations in what comes out of the mains water supply and most importantly, the chemical supplier. So we measured the density by measuring the mass of known volumes of the substances so we can calibrate. The density of the chemicals is within expected value, so we are happy with this. The different mediums we are going to suspend the objects of are going to be mixtures of the two chemicals and will therefore have a range between these values. We will take a number of objects. First, we take an egg because it's a classic. Secondly, we take the yolk of a Kinder Egg, which is the little yellow container that contains the toy which apparently chokes Americans. And this means that the Kinder Eggs are banned in the United States for some reason. I will fill one Kinder Egg yolk with water, one with water and two screws. And finally, I'll take one yolk filled with water and three screws. This varies the mass whilst keeping the volume the same. Finally, we take this box. Now, this is a box which I usually hold fresh substrates for my samples, but this one is empty and I can fill it with different things. I have two empty sample boxes which are filled with random bits of metal. The objects are then weighed 20 times each. The mean of these measurements then gives the nominal mass and the standard deviation gives the uncertainty in the mass. And these are the results. The volume of the items will also be measured. This is achieved by filling this beaker with water until it starts overflowing. Once all the overflow is drained away, I submerge the objects and that results in the beaker overflowing again. The volume of the water that spills out in this instance then gives us the volume of the object. To be more accurate, I will actually measure the mass of the overflowing water and then using our density calibration to calculate the object's volume. This is because it's easier to measure mass to high precision than volume with the equipment available. The results are on screen. I will take different mixtures of the isopropanol and water by combining known volumes of the two, and this will allow me to calculate the density. I will mix them using a magnetic stirrer to ensure that there are no density gradients and the mixture is nice and even. The object is then suspended in the medium and weighed. So here we can perform three tests to investigate this equation. The first test sees if the net force is linearly proportional to the medium's density as predicted by our equation. The second test investigates whether the slope of that straight line truly is the product of the object's volume and g. The third test investigates whether the intercept of that straight line truly is the product of the object's mass and g. So here are the results. The density of the medium sits on the x-axis and the force sits on the y-axis. You'll notice that there is a minus sign by the force to show that it is downward. The raw measurements will be shown followed by a best fit line. We start with the raw measurements for the egg, followed by the yolk filled with water, then the yolk with two screws, three screws, and now the sample boxes, box one and box two. Now qualitatively, this looks good. The net force is proportional to the medium's density, but to be absolutely sure, we must look at the fitting parameters. Now in this table, the first column shows which object was tested, the second column shows the slope, and the third column shows the intercept. Indeed, we see that the slope is larger than the uncertainty, and given that for each object, the medium's density was the only thing that changed, and therefore, the net force is proportional to the medium's density. Now this was Sleeping Warrior's big revelation, and he uses this as evidence that it's density that causes the force and not gravity. And maybe he's got a point. No, he really doesn't. This is because he didn't consider other factors. Note how the slope and the intercept are all different. There must be another factor involved here. And could this be the object's density? No, the technical phrase for this is, there's fuck all there. So the object's density is not associated with the slope or the intercept. What about the object's mass and volume? 
Our prediction states that the slope is given by the object's volume and the acceleration due to gravity, and this means that if we plot the slope against the object's volume, the slope of that line should be equal to the acceleration due to gravity at 9.80665 meters per second squared. And that is this plot. We then move to the intercept. Our prediction states that if we plot the intercept against the object's mass, then the slope should be minus g. And that is this plot. On screen, I will now show the fitting parameters with their uncertainty. And here we show that the experimentally determined values are in agreement with each other and the expected value for g. So with these experiments, we have shown that the net force is given by a straight line equation with the medium's density as the independent variable. We have also shown that the gradient is the product of the object's volume and the acceleration due to gravity. And the intercept is the product of the object's mass and the acceleration due to gravity. This is important because this shows that if we change the density, the intercept, which represents the downward force, remains unaffected. The buoyancy term is affected by the medium's density. However, if we change the acceleration due to gravity, it impacts both the intercept and the gradient. The gradient affects the upward buoyant force, so gravity affects the upward buoyant force. So this clearly shows that gravity is still a factor in Riley's experiment. But just to highlight, this does not prove that gravity as described by Newton or Einstein is a thing, but it definitely does show that density is not the only factor in determining whether an object sinks or floats, and that the downward force objects are subjected to are independent of density. If you want to come up with an alternative explanation for why this little g is there, then go for it. But these experiments show that density or buoyancy is not the thing that you are looking for. I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Thomas Miller, Johnny Ragadu, Kevin Dedman, Stringer News One, MC Toon, Cy Blacklock Hughes, Mick Simons, Ugly German Truth, Michelle Randall, Richard Russell, and Kai Broking for their support on Patreon. It meant that I could buy all the equipment needed for this, and it meant that I did not have to use the consumables at work. I will keep hold of the equipment for a few months, but in due course, I, it will be donated to a local school or a science outreach group. If you wish to repeat this experiment, there is a shopping list in the description.